Welcome to Believe in Progress, the American Association for Cancer Research Foundation's podcast. Join us as we share stories of hope and inspiration that will lift your spirits and remind you that no matter how difficult the journey may be, there's always hope. We will explore the latest breakthroughs in cancer research and hear from leading experts who are working tirelessly to find new treatments and cures in the fight against cancer. Believe in Progress isn't just about the science of cancer. It's about the human side of this disease. We'll hear from cancer survivors who have overcome incredible odds to beat cancer, thanks to the groundbreaking research and innovative treatments that are changing the landscape of cancer treatment. Join us on this journey of hope and progress. Subscribe to Believe in Progress, the AACR Foundation podcast today. Together, we can make progress in the fight against cancer and bring hope to those who need it most. Welcome to the Believe in Progress podcast. On this episode, we are speaking with Howard Brown, a Silicon Valley technology entrepreneur with IPO exits and who was a two-time stage four cancer patient, survivor, and advocate, 30 years apart. On this episode, Howard will share the keys to leading a resilient life with hope. He drives successful community leaders, business innovators, and patient advocates towards engagement, empowerment, and excellence. Howard is a best-selling author of his memoir, Shining Brightly, an award-winning international speaker and weekly podcaster. Howard also has his own Shining Brightly podcast show with 25 episodes released as of this recording. His podcast is all about overcoming with resilience, hope, and inspiration. If you want to check out Howard's podcast, you can find links in this episode's show notes. Howard recently spoke to cancer researchers and investigators while he was being honored at the AACR's 2023 annual meeting in Orlando, Florida. Howard was also selected and participated AACR's 25th anniversary cohort at the Scientist Survivor Program as an advocate mentor. At the annual meeting, Howard also shared how having the patient voice and communication, collaboration, and connection together gives all patients care partners and families hope for a better tomorrow live our lives one more second one more day one more week and one more year finding cures and battling cancer must be a team sport join us as we explore the inspiring stories of patients survivors and researchers who are making a difference in the fight against cancer this is the believe in progress podcast hosted by the AACR Foundation and featuring Howard Brown. Howard, welcome to Believe in Progress, the AACR Foundation podcast, and thank you so much. It's really an honor to have you here. Uh, Mitch, I'm just excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. So before we start a discussion, I'm going to ask those of you who are listening to this episode or watching this episode um, on your YouTube channel to please consider subscribing to our podcast sharing this episode with a friend, and heading over to our website, aacr.org, to consider making a donation. When you donate to the American Association for Cancer Research, your investment in life-saving research propels the important work of the more than 54,000 members of the AACR in driving progress against cancer. You can support life-saving cancer research with any donation you make today. Again, great pleasure to have Howard Brown with us today. Um, Howard, I've had the pleasure to meet you in person a couple times, and uh, you've been involved with AACR in, in many different ways. But I'd love to learn a little bit more about your story. You know, you, you've been dealing with cancer for a number, number of years, but tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from, and just so people can get to know you better. So I appreciate that. And um, I am grateful for the AACR, and we'll get to that um, because um, I'm alive today because of uh, medical technology and cancer research. And, um, and some personal uh, mental toughness uh, and physical toughness too. But I was born in uh, St. Louis, but I grew up in Boston, the suburbs of Boston, and I'm a twin. And that becomes very important uh, a little later down in the story. I, I love basketball my whole life. So I actually played high school and college basketball. And I went to the number one school for entrepreneurship, Babson College outside of Boston, Mass. And it changed the trajectory of my entire life. Uh, I got into uh, technology and into uh, startups. And um, I just, I, I love innovation. And um, everything was great after I graduated, except the fact that I grew a small pink nodule on my cheekbone. And at age 23 and a half, 
uh, and this is before the internet, before cell phones, and before computer use was you know really broadly adopted. And I flew home to do a speech to the American Bankers Society, and my dad took me to a local community hospital, and they said I had a little cyst, and I just wasn't feeling good. Um, and thank God it popped out. But the next visit, they took a biopsy, and then we waited weeks and weeks to find out what was going on. And I got called back to Boston and I was living in Dayton, Ohio at the time. And I go to this community hospital and there's like seven doctors around me. And they said, you have an appointment at 2 p.m. at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Don't be late. And that was the first time I'd ever heard of, of cancer. And I had no idea what I had. And I went to Dana-Farber. I did test. And I noticed that I was one of the young people in the adult waiting room So I moseyed off to the pediatric side in the Jimmy Fund with the kids uh, that were hanging out. And I still was a deer in the headlights. I didn't know why I was there. Uh, But once I was called in and they told me that I had stage four T-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, very aggressive, you know, blood cancer of the lymphatic system, I didn't hear another word. And I I had uh, some great doctors and I just was stunned. I look back, my mom was in tears and my dad was a, a statue. And we had to begin to learn and start that journey. But when you hear that words, you know, you have cancer, it's really not you. It's we have cancer uh, because it affects everybody. Yes. Uh, and, and so you've been diagnosed. You're at Dana-Farber. What, what happens next? So there's a long story to it, but no good news. I'm failing therapies. They're throwing the kitchen sink at me. I'm having tons of side effects. Um, I'm landing in the hospital. I'm doing tons of blood transfusions, platelet transfusions. And the piece of good news, and this goes back to being a twin sister, she typed an exact 100% HLA match uh, for a bone marrow transplant. And that was in about February of 1990. And they worked like hell to get me into remission. And on uh, May 17th, I checked into Dana-Farber and they put me through blasting chemotherapy. That was the protocol. And twice daily for 20 minutes, full body irradiation, which was tough stuff to get my uh, immune system down to um, zero so that my sister's bone marrow could regrow in me. And, And listen, when you sign the paperwork, they say, listen, you're taking someone else's blood or an organ. It could kill you right away. It could kill you quickly over time. Or our prayer and hope is that it will work. Well, It started to grow in me and my immune system is growing back. And then the intent of her immune system was to kill off the malignancy. Well, they were watching me and taking blood counts like crazy and it started to work. And I went on to a a very early clinical trial, ARM1, patient four of interleukin two. So I was an experimental guy, but that worked. It strengthened my natural killer cells. And I, I wore a little belt and I changed the cartridge every Tuesday. I called it my oil change with my nurses. And I started to uh, you know, build that immune system back up. And pretty much they, after they see things are working, you start to go on surveillance. And that's when the, uh, you go from diagnosis, stunned during the headlights to the treatment, and then um, you, you move forward to survivorship. And, and putting Humpty Dumpty back together again is, is really tough. And I was 24 and a half years old. So not only did I think I was going to die, I, I had to go build the bricks again and, and build my back, my um, my confidence and my physical ability and my financial ability to work a full day. And I did that by getting back in shape on the basketball court, finding my happy place. So I moved to California all the way across the country. So that's, that's part of story one, but that's a miracle that my uh, twin sister was able to give me that. Now, Mitch, not everybody has this, but I have my bag of life. This is the actual bone marrow bag that my sister's bone marrow was purple at the time they infused in me. And why I took it, I have no idea. But this bag saved my life. So it was a bone marrow transplant? Yeah, now they call it a stem Stem cell cell. transplant. But back then they called it a bone marrow transplant. And they extracted uh, my sister's bone marrow, cleaned it up a bit, uh, removed some things, and then injected into me in an infusion. Remarkable. Um, When we we talked many, many months ago, we started talking, both of us, about our love for basketball. Because, you know, I played basketball and I played basketball in college as well. And you really yeah. uh, felt a, a synergy with you. Uh, my brother is a cancer survivor, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma B cell. Um, so it's different, uh-huh. obviously. And, and he was very fortunate also because of cancer research, because they, you know, rituxan was, was discovered and, and sure enough, you know, took care of him and cured him. And 
he's still still out there, you know, living a good life. So um, that we are really, really pleased about. Well, I'm one of the longest living bone marrow transplant survivors that Dana Farber can remember because they lose track of you. Um, after you stop doing, you know, five years and your gallium scans and your blood tests and they want to do a, a bone marrow aspirin biopsy, they you kind of lose track unless you decide to keep in touch. And so this is now, you know, 34 years ago. Yeah. And um, I keep in touch with my docs. And uh, but most people don't. They go on with their lives, which is the, the point of the whole thing. And so um, I, I, I wake up every day from that and just say that I am really blessed, very grateful and very lucky yeah. from that episode there. Howard, why, uh, why, why, why California? Was it Silicon Valley? Is that what <laughs> dro drove you there? It wasn't. It was it was Southern Cal at first because oh. I was working for a large computer company. They hired me back uh, after being off for about um, 18 months, 19 months, which is quick. Um, maybe it was a little longer than that. But um, listen, my we we got a uh, we got a book on cancer. There wasn't the internet in 1990. We we had hmm. a, we had to learn this all analog days. Right. So we we were learning the game in a very slow, methodical method. It was very different than than what happened in cancer too. But um, I moved to California because that was where my job was, and I wanted the beach and the wind and warm, and I want to play basketball year round outdoors. So <laughs> it was I, 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 that that was a good reason there. That's great uh, to move out there. So you you've written a, a memoir called Shining Brightly. Um, love to hear more about that. But you share keys to leading a resilient life. Uh, could you discuss that a little bit with the audience, please? I will. Um, I I I, 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 I want to just touch base because the the story. It has to continue before I get to the book because when I was in California and I built myself back up, okay, which is you know uh, through you know emotionally, physically, financially, and and in relationships, I started to do some volunteering uh, in the Jewish community there, and I met my wife. Things were my karma changed. I got <laughs> healthy. I met my wife. I was I was a uh, Jewish things, big brother. I'm um, raising money funds for others, and life became good and sweet again. So. Uh, you, you know, I tried to put cancer in the rear view with always never forgetting that experience and all the people and uh, the doctors and everything that happened. But you, you need to move on and without ever forgetting. And I moved up to Silicon Valley and my wife and I uh, called for that frozen sperm before I ever did any chemotherapy because my doctor talked to me about fertility, even though they didn't know if I was going to live or die. And I left a sperm sample and we called for that uh, from uh, Newton Wellesley Hospital. and. Another miracle, my daughter, Emily, was born as a healthy baby girl and 11 years later from frozen sperm. So medical technology, again, you know, came back to bless me. So I, I wanted to make sure I included that. And then, unfortunately, I had a big run in Silicon Valley with IPOing technology companies, and my twin sister moved to Michigan, and I wanted my daughter to grow up with family and cousins. So I took my technology business on the road and moved to Michigan. And at age 50, I went in for my normal uh, physical and it was time for my colonoscopy. That was the age and, and not 45 as it is today. And they found a, a eight and a half centimeter tumor. Now, if I would have been screened at age 40, then I might not have had colon cancer. Might have had early stage. So getting screened is a big part of, uh, of what I do now is to save people the pain and agony of chemo, surgeries, radiation, side effects, clinical trials. The best way to, uh, to, to, uh, to basically beat cancer is not to get it. And you've got to keep up with your screening. So I preach that all the time. But I ended up getting uh, stage three uh, colon cancer and it metastasized a year later to stage four to my liver, my peritoneum, and omentum, a stomach lining, and my bowel. And things got very dark again, but we're living in the digital age. So the resource availability, the advocacy organizations, the amount of data, I could talk to real patients that had this surgery I had, which is called cytor reduction, hyperintopenia, interperitoneal chemotherapy, HIPEC. It's where they actually take out and uh, debulk all the li live and dead cancer cells in your pelvis and abdomen. And they poured hot chemotherapy inside of me and then spun me around like a rotisserie chicken. <laughs> and right now that has gotten me to three and a half years of no evidence of disease. So unfortunately, lightning struck again, right? And I got a stage four diagnosis. And listen, in the stage four world, we live with a lot of death. And it's not because of anyone giving up. It's because the cancer burden gets too great and God's calling your number. But I have right now been able to, 30 years apart, be able to talk about this, relay my experience. And again, I had to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So that's, that's the, the, the totality of the story. And what I did from cancer to COVID 
was I dictated a book. It's called Shining Brightly. Mm -hmm. For those that are be watching, I'm holding up my book, Shining Brightly, shiningbrightly.com. And this basically allowed me a therapeutic approach to invite the most important and influential people in my life and walk my life back and tell my lessons that I learned. And that's where resiliency uh, comes into play because I could have easily folded my cards and it could have gotten dark and depressive. I had a lot of bad days where I didn't want to get out of bed. And unless the dog needed to walk, I didn't get out of bed. But what I did was when I started to feel better, I started to be able to interact with um, these advocacy organizations, uh, my cheerleaders and supporters, and make sure that my medical team knew uh, exactly how we're doing so we could collaborate together and make sure that we're following the right course of action. So in the book, it's, it's, it's a great read because I'm not talking to the reader. I'm talking in these Zoom rooms to the most important people in my life. So there's mentorship, entrepreneurship, leadership. There is three cancer chapters. There's a full chapter on basketball. Right. There's a chapter on interfaith relations. And there's a chapter on the best four-letter word you're ever going to hear. And, and you do this all the time, Mitch, with your team, hope. Without hope, okay, what the AACR gives to everybody, okay, across the board, hope. If you don't have hope, where are you going? Right. And you got to mix hope with gratitude and you got you to mix it with the shining of your light. And that's where the, the, bulb, the light bulb is. And we're shining light for peace, love, and hope. Because with hope, you can make it that two steps out of bed. You can make it actually to get back to work. You can accomplish your goals. And so it's really a motivational book, not a cancer book, but um, it's, uh, it was my, one of my ways. And I'm at least likely to be a published author. But I am a published author and, a, and, a, and, a, and I'm on the speaking tour and podcast tour. That's and great. I'm just shouting from the rooftops to, uh, to go get screened and, and share my story. What they say in the movie, hope, uh, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, right? Hope is really, I, 100%. really important. So you're wearing a shirt that I recognize, Colon Town. Um, and I yes. think that relates to just some of the advocacy work that you do. Tell us, tell us a little bit about Colon Town. Tell us a little bit about many, many advocacy you know, uh, avenues that you've gone down and what you're doing to help people and give back. Yep. The, the first one I ever did is I spoke to about a thousand people in San Francisco in the Bay area for, uh, the leukemia lymphoma society for their team and training. And I was the keynote speaker there. This is back in uh, 1995. And I really was there to tell them that they were my heroes. Okay. What they were doing to uh, train and, and run a marathon or ride a, uh, uh, you know, a, a triathlon or whatever they were doing for their, their groups to raise funds that really to affect cancer research and to allow people to be able to uh, do their jobs and, and, and solve a very complex jigsaw puzzle called cancer. And so what that led me to do is I wanted to give back because the people that I met in Colon Town that had been through uh, CRS HIPAC before, I saw them, they were walking five steps or 10 steps ahead of me. So they were my cancer whisperers and cancer whisperer is a mentor, right? And now I mentor, I'm five steps ahead of other folks that are actually getting their diagnosis or in treatment. And that's what Colon Town was formed for. It's when you get diagnosed, it's how to help patients, uh, caregivers and partners. And it's all run by, by caregivers and, and, and patients. And it's an amazing organization because um, it's a complex diagnosis and there's a lot of things that you need to know and, and to be able how to deal with this on a lot of different fronts. And Colon Town, amongst one of the great advocacy organizations, is there for patients. Um, the, the cancer uh, Colon Cancer Coalition on, um, on screening and, on, and, and, and advocacy, the Colon Cancer Alliance, which I'm part of, I'm a champion there. They do so much to help the, the patient experience. And what happens is, is that we teach patients not only about their disease, we actually have them use their voice because we need to be able to tell our stories and we need to now do this in collaboration and break down previously the silos with researchers, with investigators, with clinicians, with uh, industry, with pharma and, and with uh, technology. We were the missing piece. And with us getting in there, we need each other. And, and I say this in my book and I say this and I shout from the rooftops, life and, and cancer are team sports and the patient voice inside there will help accelerate the advances that we make. And that's just what I believe in my heart. And that's what I do. So you also have been involved with one of the ACR special programs called the SSP program, the Scientist Survivor Program. Um, alumni of that program, and I believe you were a mentor in that program just recently in Orlando. 
Um, tell people that are listening and watching you here today a little bit about that program and um, perhaps why it's, we think it's such a special program and, and really important as well. So the, the, the Scientific Survivor Program, one, it was its 25th year. So just lucky and honored to be able to celebrate 25 years. But it was an ingenious um, invention uh, by Dr. Uh, Marge Foti, who's the CEO of AACR, and Anna Barker, who's just world renowned. They, they wanted the patients to actually get smarter. That's the simplicity of it. And the patient advocate, to have them smarter allows them to be able to talk. Hey, listen, we're not doctors. We're not PhDs. We're not researchers. But in order to be able to us to convey um, us as patient um, you know, uh, engagements and subject matter experts is a really important piece of the puzzle. And Right now, the opening of the door and being welcomed to the table is so exciting for us because these pharma organizations that are developing the cures and the vaccines and the better imaging and the liquid biopsies and, and the wearables, they need the patient, the patient data, the patient tumor, uh, the patient blood. All of that is now helping get the data because Dr. Barker is very clear. Data is data until it becomes usable information. And so we go through a very intensive program, and I'm fortunate that I got to do it when I was in treatment at the annual meeting in Atlanta in 2019, then, then two years virtually because of COVID, and then back uh, in person in New Orleans, and this year as an advocate mentor with a cohort of 36 of all different types of cancer, everyone trying to understand and get smart. And we do a course called Mini Med School, we present posters, and we do a group project, and you Put on about 20,000 steps I know uh, on your snooze hmm. and shoes and sneakers. And we get to meet, I mean, how privileged are we to meet with the FDA, the uh, National Cancer Institute, the NIH, and to meet with subject matter experts? It's a very much an honor and a privilege to be uh, accepted into the program. And it is work to complete the program. But that work allows us to go back and, and strengthen our advocacy. And how many times now uh, I, I, I've now built up you know, my credentials. I'm learning. I'm going to continue to learn. But now being the honor of being asked to actually speak in front of uh, cancer researchers and investigators, being called on patient advisory councils for the pharmaceutical company and medical device company and therapeutics. It's such a beautiful thing that we are being welcomed. And, and it's long overdue, but it's a beautiful well, thing. Thank you so much for your, your leadership and, and taking part in that and you know, being a great advocate for, for the organization. When you meet people that are battling cancer, families that are battling cancer, what, what do you, I mean, obviously it's different for different people, but what kind of message do you, you know, send them? Do you, like, do you try to motivate or what, what's your message? So the, the, the first key message, and I actually say this in, in the cancer chapters in my book, is that this is your time to be selfish and learn to accept help. You have to let others help you, okay? Whether it's the meal, you know, the calendar of meals from the soccer team, moms and dads, whether it's uh, getting cheerleaded, whether it's a GoFundMe, let people help you in your time of need. And the person who is in the time of need the most is your caregiver. Okay, my caregiver parents and my caregiver wife are angels on earth, just like our nurses and our infusion nurses, um, what they do every day. My, my wife had to basically take over running the household, raising our daughter, and making sure and keeping track of medical bills, appointments, when to take the medicines. Um, and so I actually, that's the first piece of advice that I give anyone that gets diagnosed is start, it's your time to be selfish, learn to accept help. And um, I've done that. The other thing, the second piece is that you need to stay hydrated, you need to stay active, and you need to get enough sleep. And sleeping is healing. And that's all about taking care of yourself when you're in the midst of this. And um, sometimes it's hard to do. And if you cannot get out of bed that day, don't. But when you can get out of bed, you could actually just go up and down the stairs. You got to get your blood moving. The worst thing to do is to be sedentary. Right. And uh, the other thing is, is, the next thing is, is get a mentor. Okay. Get a buddy, get a mentor. There's organizations like Emmerman Angels and the Alliance that do this. Get someone here that you can talk to. Okay. Or get professional help. Talk to a nurse navigator, talk to a social worker, talk to another cancer patient. You don't have to keep that all bottled up. And I have to tell you, men and, um, you know, uh, Trevor uh, Maxwell was on the cover of, uh, of cancer, cancer Day, Day magazine. He started it for men. Men tend to isolate and men don't want to share their feelings and men are macho. You don't have to be macho. 
can, can, cancer is, a, is not something that you actually have to just conquer yourself. And so those are the three basic things that I start with when someone actually gets a diagnosis. Research is really, really important. You talked a little bit about team sport, which I, I kind of love. I, I haven't really heard that phrase before, but, but tell our audience why in your mind, this team sport or, or funding cancer research is, is really critical for, for future advances. Well, first of all, it's, it's vital. All right. We, we, we can't make advances um, in, in, in this. This costs money. And this is, is, is not a, just a simple thing that uh, you, know, you flip over uh, and, and, you know, you, we do a, a fundraiser and then it's done. This, this is ca- cancer is something that we're going to have in, in our lifetimes. And hopefully we eradicate it in future lifetimes. Colon cancer is on the rise in young people. This isn't your granddaddy's disease anymore. Young people are getting colon cancer and we need to fix that. And so we've had some great breakthroughs and, and immunotherapy is one of them. It is starting to break that down. People are healing. They are living longer with cancer. I think there is the stat is 16 million living and then it's going to be about 25 million people living with cancer or maybe it's 18 million. Um, but we all, all these, we are the why, right? So what you do every day by asking people to support cancer research is to actually take Howard Brown and allow him to live one more second, one more day, one more week one more month and one more year living his life with his family. And that's why you want to donate because in order to get there and make these advances, we have to do that. And, and, and this is what the organization, it. that's the core foundation of what you do, Mitch, at AACR, L- love is the to message. raise those vital funds to move us forward. Love that message. How, how do you stay in shape? You still playing basketball or, or what do you, are you, you're walking and running? What, what are you doing? So I'm active. I, I, I like to bike and uh, mountain bike a little, and I like to hike, but I'm still playing ball at age 57. I, right. I, I'm not the same guy. I've slowed it up, but I, I've developed a three-pointer, even with stage three uh, peripheral <laughs> neuropathy. I can knock down a three. Um, I'm a point guard on the court, and I played last night. I didn't play as well, but on Monday I played as well. I got called at the last second. I couldn't miss. So I'm just so grateful to be on the court because that is the happy place. And you know this, Mitch. I know. That's the stress-free zone. Yes. Okay. You can talk trash. Yeah. I don't have a worry on the court at all, except for the fact that, you know, did the guy make a, you know, a, a back pick or did we, did we score? Did we win? And it's all in fun and games. And I, I love it. And everyone needs to find their happy place, right? It, it could be yoga, meditation, cooking. I don't care. Go find it. Go there often. And um, I like to get on the court at least uh, two to three times a week. Interesting you say that. For many, many years when I was in a low spot, I would just go get the ball, go shoot hoops, and everything kind of took care of itself. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's really amazing. It's really cool. Um, so people want to get in touch with you. People want You showed us the book earlier. Could you let the yeah. audience know best way to communicate with Howard Brown. You also have a podcast. So I would love to hear about that for a minute or two, how we can sure. get in touch with you at, at, for the podcast as well. Easy to get in touch with me. Shiningbrightly.com leads all avenues to me, whether it's speaking, podcasting, the book, uh, or advocacy. And um, it's it's just been such a, a way to be able to have me grow and to actually you know rebuild you know that, that blueprint of survivorship. And um, I, I, I really do. Uh, every day, I try to actually impact someone for screening um, the uh, disparity communities or the remote communities or the uh, poor economic communities because screening, which we didn't do during COVID, actually saves lives. So that's the first thing. But the podcast itself um, is that you have to have a platform, okay? And this platform allows me to talk about overcoming things but we always end with inspiration. So for those that are listening, I'm putting on my shining brightly glasses because we put the shining brightly spotlight on inspiration. <laughs> All right. There's enough bad news out there in the world and I'm not uh, ignoring it to any extent, but let's talk about shining brightly each day so that we can make the world a better place for ourselves, for others, and then for our communities. And so that's why I do a podcast. So we end with inspiration. And, um, I, it's, it's, it's been amazing. I'm meeting some of the most amazing people in the world that against all odds are, are breathing, living their lives and, uh, and giving back. Well, it's awesome. Howard, you are an inspiration and you are a gem and we are so thankful that you're doing what you do for the community at large. We're so thankful that you're supporting and advocating for the AACR and, um, I'm happy you're happy. And, um, you know, I love being in your company 
and honored that you gave us a few minutes of your time today and we're behind you all the way keep keep doing what you do because it it that's what i love i love passion enthusiasm and shining brightly i really do love that don't know if i have any specs quite like that but um you're you're the best keep doing the great things that you're doing we're really fortunate to have you around I'm grateful to the, uh, you and the AACR. It means such a big part of my life, and uh, it's helped. It's helped help me a ton. It helped me grow. It helped me get better. Help me heal. Please keep uh, keep doing your thing, which is getting uh, people to do the vital donations to support the research that we all desperately need. And I'm grateful to be on your podcast. Great. I will do that, and you be well, my friend. Thanks so much for your time, Howard. Thank you. Once again, thank you to our listeners, supporters, and donors. Remember, your support drives the progress against cancer. Once again, please consider subscribing to our podcast, sharing this episode with a friend, and heading over to our website, aacr.org, to consider making a donation. Thank you for listening to Believe in Progress, the AACR Foundation podcast. This podcast is produced by CollegeCast LLC. Please visit www.collegecastpodcast.com for more information. And remember, cancer research saves lives.